Welcome to the recorded version of Frontotemporal Degeneration, the importance of knowledge, advocacy, and support to advance quality care from January 16, 2018, part of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series sponsored by the Administration for Community Living. Thanks so much, Steve. Welcome, everyone, to the webinar today. In this webinar series, the Administration for Community Living's National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center has partnered with the American Society on Aging. We're pleased to have all of you in attendance today. Our presentation focuses on frontotemporal degeneration, the importance of knowledge, advocacy, and support to advance quality care. Before we start, Aaron Long of the Administration for Community Living will provide a brief welcome. Aaron. Hi, everyone. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us for our first webinar of 2018. We are very excited to launch our uh, 2018 series with this very important topic. And I just want to thank, on behalf of ACL, Ms. Denny and the Hendersons for being so generous with their time and uh, sharing their knowledge. And with that, we'll go back to you, Sari. Thank you. So for today's webinar, we'll hear from Sharon Denny. Sharon's the Program Director at the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration. For the past six years, she's led a committee of clinicians and family caregivers who publish Partners in FTD Care, an education initiative for healthcare providers interested in FTD. Branton Marie Henderson also are with us today. Branton Marie have been married for 36 years and have two children and three grandchildren. Brandt was a Director of Development at Massachusetts General Hospital for many years. He retired in 2011 at age 57 after being diagnosed with behavioral variant FTD. Marie recently stepped down as Chief Nurse Midwife at Massachusetts General Hospital to educate others about FTD and spend more time with Brandt and their grandchildren. So with that, we'll turn it over to the three of you. Sharon, I believe you'll start us out. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Sari. It's wonderful to be with you. So just to give you a little bit of guidance about where we're heading today, the fundamental objectives are to help you to identify three ways that FTD differs from Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, to identify three main clinical presentations of FTD and their symptoms, to describe two positive approaches in FTD care. So let's get started. As I'm sure many of you know, dementia is a very broad term. It describes a decline in cognitive skills that interferes with daily functioning. So this could be memory, reason, reasoning, language, and attention. And there are a lot of forms of dementia. Some are reversible. Some are progressive and neurodegenerative. And as I'm sure folks are aware, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia in older adults. That's not true, however, when we look at people who are younger. So FTD is really characterized by being the most common dementia in people under age 60. FTD is not a memory disorder. And FTD is poorly recognized and difficult to diagnose. And together, these three factors really differentiate it from Alzheimer's disease and really characterize the experience of people with FTD and their families. So FTD is the most common form of dementia under age 60. This means that it typically begins in midlife. About 60% of the people with FTD are diagnosed between the ages of 45 and 64, which is really fully 10 years earlier than the average age of diagnosis in Alzheimer's. And while the average age of onset is quite wide, there, while the average age of onset is in the, in the mid-50s, the range is really quite wide. There are people who've been diagnosed with FTD as young as in their 20s, although very few of them, and also as old as in their 80s. So there's a great range of diversity there with the bulk of people being diagnosed and having a younger onset in midlife. The average course of the disease is approximately 7 to 11 years. But this, too, can range quite a bit. So there are some aggressive forms of FTD where the life expectancy may be two or three years, and then other people live 20 or more years with a diagnosis of FTD. So people with FTD tend to have fewer comorbid health conditions. Again, the younger onset is a factor here. And they're often in robust physical health and physically active in their daily lives and, and um, routines. So the younger onset of FTD from the start requires different approaches to care than older persons with dementia. 
Another aspect of this disorder that's significant is that FTD affects the entire family system in ways that Alzheimer's disease and other later onset dementias do not. So most notably, someone with FTD may have young children or teens in the home. The demands and the impact of caring for a parent with FTD can be very disruptive to students and young adults who are working towards um, finishing their academic careers and beginning to emancipate into their own into supporting themselves in their own lives. So special care is needed to support all family members, both emotionally and to help them logistically to finish these milestones in development to be able to establish careers and enjoy peer relationships, while they're also tugging and trying to figure out how best to support family dealing with the diagnosis. Because FTD forces patients and very often their family caregivers out of the workforce during their prime earning years, this type of dementia has a particularly negative impact on family finances. And in turn, it imposes a disproportionate economic burden on society. A study that was funded by AFTD and published in Neurology just a couple of months ago showed that the average annual costs associated with FTD are about $120,000 a year, which is nearly twice the annual cost of Alzheimer's disease. Household income was shown to fall by as much as 50%. And so one of the truly um, devastating effects of FTD and its younger onset is on all the developmental factors in a family, certainly the financial status that people are facing. So FTD is not a memory disorder. So the second way that, Alzheimer's, that FTD differs from Alzheimer's is that it is not primarily characterized by difficulties in memory. Um, it is marked primarily by progressive behavior, language, and or motor changes. And memory is very often intact, especially early on. So it's important to think of FTD as it's not a single disease, but it is a spectrum of neurodegenerative disorders that all affect the brain's frontal and temporal lobes. So the temporal and the frontal lobes, these are the areas of the brain that house um, and are in charge of more of our executive functions, behavior, language, and motor changes. So one way of thinking about this is really that the location of the disease in the brain determines the symptoms. And this is true especially early on. So the earliest symptoms, whether they appear in the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes or perhaps the motor cortex, those are the symptoms that are going to define the earliest um, identification of the disease and become part of the clinical diagnosis and drive the clinical diagnosis. So people are probably familiar with the frontal and temporal lobes, but a really easy, quick check on that is if you take your hand and put it on your forehead, we're talking frontal lobes. This is where reasoning, decision-making, control of behavior, these executive functions, problem-solving, attention and concentration, and emotional control are largely um, uh, housed and based in the brain. And then if you take your hands and put them over above each ear, these um, temporal lobes on the sides of the brain are the areas that are more in charge of processing sensory information. The right temporal lobe is involved in visual memory, pictures, shapes, sounds, and music, and the inhibition of speech. The left temporal lobe is critically involved in understanding words and names, differentiating sounds and smells, and being able to sort new information. We're going to explore these symptoms a little bit further as we go along. So I mentioned that the FTD disorders are not a single disease. And here on this slide, you'll see that the clinical diagnoses are the um, determinations, it's the determination made by the doctor's exam, the patient's history, and the symptoms that are showing up and that can be evaluated in the clinic. And so it's important to appreciate that there are three different main clinical presentations of FTD. There are those uh, folks who experience changes in behavior and personality, or people who ex experience changes in language and communication, and thirdly, changes in motor function. So many people who um, have a passing familiarity with FTD might likely think of behavioral variant FTD. So behavioral variant FTD you'll see here is also sometimes called frontotemporal dementia or PICS disease. And these terms are still used often in the clinic, 
whereas under the current criteria, the technical term used by clinicians in diagnosis is generally now behavioral variant FTD. So this subtype accounts for about 60% of the people um, diagnosed with FTD. Where language and communication symptoms are the earliest and most prominent to be seen, the clinical diagnosis is very often primary progressive aphasia. And there are three subtypes of primary progressive aphasia as well. And there are several uh, FTD disorders that present with changes in motor function, and these are called cortical basal syndrome, progressive supranuclear palsy. There are some people who have FTD with ALS symptoms or motor neuron disease, and then there are some folks who have FTD with Parkinsonism, and these are movement symptoms, but not um, the same disease process as Parkinson disease. So FTD is diagnosed through, as I had mentioned earlier, a, bunch, a, a series of um, clinical exams. A careful medical history is very important, and the input from the family is important in understanding the context of how changes that are seen are not characteristic for this particular person. Increasingly, neuropsychological exams are very important to be able to assess the specific types of cognitive functions that are um, perhaps impaired. And brain imaging is the, the third aspect that is critical in making a diagnosis. So many people have, um, many people have not heard of FTD, including many doctors, which makes the experience more challenging for folks from the start. Um, and increases the difficulty of people finding services and being able to um, find the supports that they need. So FTD affects approximately 60,000 people in the U.S., which adds to the limited experience that many professionals have in serving folks with this disease. It's just not as common as Alzheimer's. So if Alzheimer's affects about 5.5 million people, Lewy body dementia is another type of uh, dementia that affects folks in different ways, but is still relatively more common with uh, about 1.4 million people affected in the U.S. And so the current estimates of 50 to 60,000 people in the U.S. having FTD is the best number that we have. There's a, a fairly broad agreement that this is probably an underestimate of the number of people with this disease. But given the challenges in diagnosis currently that we have and um, the difficulty in doing a truly broad epidemiological study, this is the best estimate that we have right now. There aren't any treatments for FTD um, that are disease specific at all. And um, one of the other areas where FTD differs from Alzheimer's is that in Alzheimer's disease, about 5% of the people may have a familial inheritance of the disease. In FTD, there's about 40% of the people who have a family history of neurodegenerative disease somewhere in their family tree. It may be FTD, it may be Parkinson's disease, it might be ALS or Alzheimer's. Um, and then within that, about 10 to 12% of all cases of FTD are caused by an identified genetic mutation. So again, in Alzheimer's, I believe it's about 5%. In FTD, about 10 to 12% of identified cases are caused by a genetic inheritance. This portion of our population is currently really driving research ahead and is allowing us to understand, to begin to understand these diseases better and drive targets for treatment as we continue to um, learn more about them. So FTD is very difficult to diagnose. On average, it takes about 3.2 years for a family to begin the process of recognizing there's something seriously wrong to coming to a, a complete evaluation and having FTD identified as the culprit. It's a, very process, it's a very frustrating process for most families. It does involve lots of evaluations, a lot of um, uncertainty, really. The symptoms of FTD very often overlap with psychiatric disorders, such as depression or bipolar disorder, or with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And because people are not expecting a neurodegenerative disease in someone in their 40s or 50s, it often leads them down the path of being treated for some of these other diagnoses first, whether it's depression or bipolar disorder, for a period of time until usually through advocacy by the family and the, pointing out that the treatments are not helpful, that they're able to make sure that they 
continue along the process of seeing specialists and having the rest of the neurological evaluation so that the um, true cause can be identified. Another aspect is that very often people with behavioral FTD in particular may not be aware of their changing behavior. Um, part of the impact on the brain in the, in the frontal and temporal lobes is a loss of self-awareness for many people. And in this regard, the input from the family is especially important because um, the, the process of evaluation can be delayed if the individual goes to the doctor and has trouble accurately reporting the changes that they're experiencing. And this is another confounding factor um, that requires the patient and the family to truly be partners from the start in working with healthcare providers. So while there are currently clear clinical criteria for diagnosis of the FTD disorders, there aren't any biomarkers, or so there aren't any specific tests, a blood test, or any particular way to diagnose the disease pathology with certainty until after the person has passed away. And this uncertainty about a diagnosis can be extremely stressful for the person and their family because of the types of changes that are happening in the individual's behavior, their ability to work, their ability to engage in family relationships. To have them not be explained for such a long period of time um, is particularly difficult. So as you can see, there's really three factors that contribute to a higher stress, higher level of stress higher isolation, and a higher care burden for folks with FTD because it is younger onset, because the symptoms are poorly understood, and because it's relatively rare, there's a greater isolation among folks facing this disease and a harder um, challenge to find access to services. So at this point, I'd like to pause and ask um, to bring in Brant and Marie into our conversation to have them talk a little bit about their experience in terms of the emergence of symptoms and um, their path to a diagnosis. So um, welcome and thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Can you just tell us a little bit about what the earliest changes were that you noticed that were troubling? Um, sure, Sharon. Um, what tipped me off is I was falling behind at work and I was losing my executive function skills. I was still good at visualizing the big picture and devising a strategy, but I couldn't execute. Phone calls wouldn't be made. Letters were not written. I was always an energetic person who pursued my work vigorously. And I was starting to experience apathy. I no longer cared about my job like you used to. I stopped reading peer-reviewed medical journals. I would spend hours trying to catch up with work that felt like I was spiraling down. I was aware that I was having cognitive problems and not depression. Packing for a trip became an impossible task. I couldn't get organized to book appointments and found myself in a precarious position in my job. And because of work's demands, I had been in a heightened state of anxiety, always spinning. I was never at ease. I was disconnecting from my wife, Marie, from family and friends. At the same time, my emotional response could be highly disproportionate. I always admired Senator Ted Kennedy, but I cried buckets throughout his long funeral rites. Movies can lead to tears. On the other hand, I can be incredibly detached emotionally. I have three beautiful grandsons. I do not feel for them any of the feelings or just a, frigid, a smidgen of the feelings that parents feel for their, or grandparents feel for their grandchildren. I was staying up later and later. I just dropped my clothes by the bed. Soiled clothes were being hung up in the closet, and Marie was noticing I was getting lax about my personal hygiene. I, speak, I spoke perhaps too freely on occasion. Um, one time right after the, the Great Recession began and the economy was collapsing, I was checking out at uh, the checkout counter at a Whole Foods, and a man in a very expensive suit and dress coat was fiddling with uh, the device to try to put in his code to pay for his lunch with an ATM. And he turned to me and he said, can you believe I'm an investment banker and I don't know how to use this thing? And without thinking, I said, I can't believe you're an investment banker and you still have a job. <laughs> um, that, that, 
can, let me bring Marie in here at this point. So, Marie, was your experience of these changes the same as Brant's? He's described them very eloquently. What was your experience during this time? Um, I would, if there was one word that could capture this time period, was one of confusion. I just didn't understand what was going on. Um, Brant had always organized our date nights and in charge of our social events. He just did it, and he did it with such enthusiasm, and all of a sudden, that wasn't happening, or he would, we would make an arrangement to meet at a restaurant after work, and he wouldn't come, he wouldn't come, he wouldn't come, because he was trying to finish up that work, but wasn't expressing to me that he was having trouble finishing work. Um, and I thought, well, that's, that's really odd. Um, and then sometimes I would be picking up around the house, and I'd find, uh, you know, cards that he bought for me, but he never sent to me. Um, so it was just very, very confusing. Uh, he would also not call me at work anymore. Sometimes he would just call at odd times just say, no, I love you today, and all that seemed to slowly stop. I also noticed the care of his clothes. He, um, Brent had to wear expensive suits for the type of work he did. He was a major fundraiser, um, and I would see his clothes just kind of not hung up or his shirt with um, – one sleeve in and one sleeve out. But I think one thing that what puzzled me are these are not concerns you call a doctor for to say, you know, my husband didn't hang up his clothes. I think I'm going to call the doctor today. Um, or my husband didn't send me a card for Valentine's Day. I think I'm going to call the doctor. So I, I wasn't thinking I didn't understand what was happening, but I wasn't thinking something so serious was wrong. So how did the both of you move into that world of asking doctors what was going on? Um, I'll let Brent speak to that. Um, well, as I was getting more and more frustrated and I was understanding that there was something wrong with my brain, I knew that the processor wasn't working. So first I sought out the psychiatrist and said, Maybe I'm a good candidate for cognitive behavioral therapy or something. But like most patients, I was misdiagnosed several times before getting the acronym one. I once prescribed stimulants to focus attention, and that helped a bit. But almost everyone with FTD is first diagnosed with bipolar, as was I. One medication after another was prescribed for me for the supposed bipolar symptoms, and I found myself sleepwalking in a drug fog. On a couple of occasions, family members found me face first on the living room floor and brought me to bed, but I had no recollection. And this was a particularly difficult time for us as the side effects of the drugs, including the hallucinations, were very intense. So I told my psychiatrist that something was seriously amiss, both cognitively and emotionally, and asked for his help to get appropriate testing. And I had to be persistent in it. I said, I'm not taking any more lithium. If this is bipolar, I'm missing the fun part. This is cognitive. So in the summer of 2009, I began testing, and in time, a group of Massachusetts General Hospital neurologists, neuropsychiatrists, neuropsychologists, neuroradiologists um, took a look at my case. And over the course of 15 months, I had two functional MRIs, a PET scan, and a barrage of neuro neuropsychological tests performed twice over the course of a 15 a year. I was 57 in January of 2011 when Marie and I sat down with my neurologist at MGH. He broke the news to Marie and me that I had mild cognitive impairment due to behavioral variant FTD that ultimately causes death. We were stunned, but we couldn't go home because of work appointments. But it was a, we were overwhelmed and it was just we were not prepared for that life-changing news. Exactly. So thank you very much for sharing that. And I'm going to stop you there so that we can look a little bit more at some of the symptoms that you described and then come back and talk with you further about how you're adjusting and making adjustments to the diagnosis. So folks will recognize here some of the things that Brandt has described as cognitive symptoms in FTD that he was experiencing early. And again, these often go along with the executive functions that are part of the frontal lobe's job for us. Difficulty making and carrying out plans. Difficulty paying attention, sustaining and redirecting attention. Difficulty in reasoning and problem solving. 
Then if we look at early behavioral symptoms in FTD, you know, we talk about FTD as affecting the social brain, those frontal lobe skills that allow us to share close interpersonal relationships with others. And uh, you'll see my little graphic here says, who's this man in this house? Sometimes the experience that people have is this is not my husband, this is not my wife, and yet as Marie said, these are small things that are not necessarily going to rise quickly to the level of there's a serious neurological disease here. So some of these behavioral symptoms include apathy, which Brant mentioned, losing that interest or that energy, that drive to be involved in things. The loss of empathy or sympathy is particularly insidious when it comes to the impact of these diseases on relationships. The lack of self-awareness, and I had mentioned earlier where there are folks who are not aware that they are becoming different, that their behavior is changing, and that this gets in the way of getting a diagnosis and certainly is a factor in planning care. Disinhibition or increased impulsive behaviors are common in behavioral FTD, poor judgment, decline in personal hygiene, and violations of personal space. Um, these are all things that can be associated with early behavioral FTD. Additional symptoms include some of the things that you see here. Most notably, I wanted to call out compulsive or repetitive behaviors, which are very common. Different kinds of behaviors are possible, a whole array of behaviors. Some people have catchphrases they say over and over and over. Some people count aloud or hum. Some people have um, lip smacking or clapping kinds of behaviors that become part of the presentation of the disease for them. There are changes in eating behavior that are pretty common in behavioral FTD. There might be craving for sweets or unexplained weight gain or difficulty moderating the amount that people eat. Um, in addition to repetitive actions, some people will develop pretty complex routines, a roaming routine of walking a fixed route, collecting cans or hoarding objects, counting money. These are all things that can be present in folks with behavioral FTD, but not always. Um, utilization behavior or touching or using pic um, items that are in, the, in a person's view that um, crosses some boundaries of what's socially appropriate. These are things that can also happen in behavioral FTD. If we look at the language symptoms of the clinical presentation known as primary progressive aphasia, what's notable here is that people may know exactly what they want to say. These folks do not necessarily have some of the other cognitive changes early on that we see in behavioral FTD, but they have trouble with the words, with the articulation of, um, of expressive language, or in some cases, the meaning of words is lost. And so, again, within this large category of primary progressive aphasia, the experts can parse this into three additional subtypes based on the particular type of changes in language that are seen. Most commonly, people with agrammatic PPA will have trouble with speech. It becomes, their speaking becomes very effortful. It's very hard for them to articulate or to find the words, even though they do know exactly what they want to say. In PPA, it's especially important to realize that because of that awareness, it's very, very frustrating for folks to not be able to express themselves as they did before, to not be able to keep up with social conversation. And this can lead to a tendency to withdraw, and there is a higher risk of depression in people with PPA because of these changes to their ability to express themselves and to connect with others. And in the motor symptoms realm, these allied uh, movement disorders, the symptoms that go along with them are what you see here. So different ones that are hallmarks of different of the movement and motor disorders. But again, these can be very difficult to identify early on in the process of diagnosis unless folks are getting to the right specialists who can look for some of these nuances. So now I want to go back actually to Brant and Marie and ask them to tell us a little bit more about how they um, began to adjust to this diagnosis in, in their daily lives. Okay, well, I, um, I can't go forward without saying how blessed I am to have Marie as my wife and my partner in this journey. And because it's behavioral, the disease can be incredibly disruptive. 
the spouse doesn't know what to expect as I can be pretty normal on some days. And other days, my behavior can be totally frustrating. Marie loves me, is learning with me, and stands by me. Now, after the diagnosis, we booked a trip to the Berkshire Mountains in western Massachusetts to spend time with each other and try to absorb all what it meant. We knew we had to share the news, and soon thereafter, we wrote to our families describing the symptoms and sharing the results. And I described how I, we got to the point of diagnosis, and I said, the good news is, is my inability to function effectively in work, love, and home life is not due to a character defect, moral turpitude, and just not getting it down. The bad news is that my inability to function effectively in work, love, and home life is not due to a character defect, moral turpitude, and not just giving a damn. As uh, Sharon has already mentioned, it's estimated that 75% of patients with FTD are unaware that they have a problem, no matter how confused or outrageous their behavior. I am aware, or sometimes just aware that I'm unaware. And what Marie and I fear most is that the emotional bonds between lover and friend and the connections to children, family, and friends will continue to be lost. My bonds are weakening. It's happening. Several years into the disease, the apathy has increased and empathy decreased. So I think uh, when the diagnosis first came, we were just scrambling for information like, what was this? Um, our neurologist um, slipped and said, uh, well, you know, FTD, and we knew he was not talking about flowers, but we were like, what is he talking about? Um, so it was just trying to get a hold of what does this mean for us, uh, for Brant, for our lives, and it was just, um, you know, I, I think we were stunned. I know I've experienced shock of, like, my active, brilliant husband has this disease. Um, it was really tough. It was, it was just really tough. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. Uh, we, Can I just – go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I would say that, you know, Brent and I have – we've talked about how are we going to live with this, and um, we are living with an unknown and everyone progresses differently with the disease. So. Our thing is we try to focus on how much Brant can do today. He can still make soup, um, but we've had to make adjustments. I have to line up the ingredients. And it is, ex it is important that we exercise control of that which we still have control. Uh, before FTD, our marriage was full and fulfilling and normal, and today um, it's just a little bit difficult to plan things to – we're not sure if we go out for dinner, we have to go earlier. Brant's much more quiet at the table. And so we just have to change our expectations. Um, and also, you know, things are hard. Um, like I didn't know he was having trouble with the menu. And you don't get a printout or to say, oh, today uh, the disease has progressed. Now it's hard for Brant to pick food off a menu. So he was getting overwhelmed, um, so I have to help him narrow down the choices. So sometimes before we go into the restaurant, I'll say, hey, Grant, do you feel like fish today or do you feel like a vegetarian dish? Just to kind of uh, get some sense to help um, avoid like a crisis when we're just trying to order food. And so can I, can I just ask to, you know, Grant, for you to go from being employed at a very high level to not being employed is a significant part of that early adjustment. Can you just speak for a moment about what that was like? Well, it's, it's very, very odd. Um, I, was, it was, I was tremendously relieved. I think it's, it's odd when you think of it, but I was tremendously relieved to have a clinical diagnosis that I wasn't going crazy, or if I was going crazy, at least he knew why. Um, um, the, the hospital was very good. Uh, I'm not fired. I am on extended medical leave. So 
I didn't feel like I was kicked out. And unfortunately, so many people with FTD lose their jobs before they get a diagnosis, and then they lose their benefits. And you have I also, start- I think, well, excuse me, you've, you've worked hard to find ways, as Marie said, of find things that you can do that will provide some engagement and some structure um, through volunteering and using your skills in different ways, which mm-hmm. um, I, I understand to have been valuable to you as well. Yes, uh, I do miss the intellectual stimulation of working in one of America's leading academic medical centers. I miss the camaraderie of colleagues. It can be pretty isolating. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to move us along again so that we have make, make sure that we have time for questions from our listeners at the end as well. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit about different approaches to care in FTD. You know, I mentioned earlier that there really aren't any treatments specifically for FTD. Um, Research is advancing, and there are some early clinical trials that offer some promise. But at this point, there's also, you know, in addition to no medicine approved for FTD, there aren't really any standards of care established in the field of FTD care. So each person is working to find the best possible approach for themselves and the best available services that will meet what they need. And at this point in time, we often will say that the best intervention in FTD is a well-informed, empowered person with the disease and care partner. Um, You've already heard how advocacy is important in getting a diagnosis. Advocacy continues to be important. Education continues to be important as people are reaching out and asking for assistance um, because there aren't any natural services that are, there aren't any specific services that are designed for folks with FTD and the services that they often need are naturally developed for folks who are older with a different type of um, cognitive impairment. And so the more we can help individuals and families be aware and well-educated, the more they can also work then at a grassroots level to help create the services and the systems that they need. So advocacy is especially important as people are younger and may not be eligible for services as well. Uh, Most of the services, of course, are in the aging world. This is our audience, I think, for for the the program today. But the idea that um, finding ways to adapt programs and services to incorporate people who are younger, more physically mobile, more active, um, and have very, very different types of impairment is really important. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, particularly many of the communication strategies fundamentally start with good dementia care in general. It's important to realize that an FTD with the frontal lobe involvement, cognitive processing slows down. And so as someone's thoughts get stuck, um, it may be harder for them to process through a request, a verbal request, and may be harder for them to develop a verbal answer. These delays in processing, combined with a couple of other aspects of, of FTD, including more often a blank facial expression and difficulty um, interpreting interpersonal behaviors and a reduced interpersonal skills can often lead to misinterpretation of the response on the part of the person with FTD, which is often interpreted as being angry or being resistant. Um, And that alone can often add to escalation of some behavior symptoms. So when the communication style can quite deliberately be focused on being calm and trying to keep the stress level down and trying to pay attention to what things might trigger an escalation in symptoms, not expecting what we would consider maybe a normal response from somebody who really looks otherwise healthy, but to recognize that the process of thoughts getting stuck is going to dramatically change the, the fluidity nature of communication and can actually contribute to escalation in behavior symptoms. The other thing that I want to make sure that we that I point out is that within PPA, where people are diagnosed early with communication difficulties, the importance of speech language therapy is continuing to grow. And so 
um, speech language therapy isn't going to restore the skills that are lost to the disease and it's not going to stop the progression of the disease, but the strategies that people can learn and the assistance that can be given to caregivers for adapting communication styles is really very helpful for being able to maintain communication and help the individual with PPA compensate for the particular skills that they're losing. And so we always recommend that, that an SLP consultant be brought in early for folks with primary progressive aphasia to begin to use some of these strategies and then adapt them over time as the disease progresses. So without a doubt, behavioral and environmental strategies are the most effective interventions for FTD behaviors and symptoms. So creating the right environment, something that's a low demand, low stimulation, structured environment, can also reduce the stress and the stimulation that often contribute to behavioral symptoms. People with FTD do well with routine, creating a positive daily routine of individually preferred activities, exercise, social engagement. These create a, an important foundation on which to build other interventions and strategies for managing care. To develop the appropriate interventions requires understanding how FTD is affecting the, the information processing. That it isn't, um, like redirection is, has to look different in FTD because people's memories are intact. And so finding additional ways to be particularly attuned to what the expression of the symptoms are in a, in a particular person and adapt your strategies from there is very important. The other challenge is often that um, Again, people look well and they can interact and have good days and bad days and yet there are some really significant impairments that they may be experiencing. And so keeping that in mind and keeping that in the care plan is especially important and often difficult when folks are used to working with people with older or later onset dementia and in mixed programs, whether it's a day program or residential facilities, this is often an issue for the community as well to realize that folks with FTD have similar impairments, um, have, have, have a level of impairment, but it might not be the same. And so the strategies and the interventions need to really be adapted in order to help them with their best functioning. It's really important that being proactive about ensuring safety is part of every plan in FTD. So as Brant mentioned, individual functioning can vary notably day to day. People may have good days and bad days. And there isn't a real clear trajectory where changes in judgment and decision making and self-awareness are involved. They aren't predictable. Um, and so for as difficult as it can be to make some of these adjustments, it's really important to be proactive to try to make sure that limiting access to driving or limiting access to you know, unfettered access to family finances or guns or computers or tools or any of these things where an individual's declining judgment may inadvertently create additional crisis or conflict is really important because prevention is going to be much better than trying to um, step in after the fact. Um, so notifying banks and local police and stores of the person's medical condition if that's relevant for the types of symptoms that they're presenting is important to do to bring those folks on board with the plan and create that safe environment for them. Monitoring um, individuals for risks of falls and the need for adaptive equipment is similarly important for safety at home. And so um, the safety factors in FTD are often upfront in terms of anticipating um, how to keep the person safe and how to help them to be able to function at their best possible level. It's also important um, that people do have help to get connected to community services. Um, and as we mentioned before, they may be too young to be uh, eligible for some of the needed services, and many providers aren't sure of how to integrate someone into their care. But we do know that all of the full array of home health and community providers and rehab therapies can be very helpful for people with FTD. And so um, it's important to try to facilitate that and bring in from a care planning process 
the family and the individual right from the start. I do want to make a note about residential facility care, that some people with behavioral FTD can benefit from residential care earlier in the disease than in Alzheimer's. So certainly if there are behavior issues that require constant supervision or if there's children and teens at home that make having that low stress environment impossible, um, considering facility care earlier can be very helpful as a, a management strategy in FTD. A word about medications. There really aren't any FDA-approved FDA drugs for FTD. Um, and the Alzheimer's medications, cholinesterase inhibitors, are actually not indicated in FTD and can, be, um, can contribute to increases in aggressive behavior. And so if you're working with someone who has not had medications reviewed in a while, um, that's a valuable thing to help them to do because periodically medications for depression or bipolar disorder have been in place and may be added to rather than truly evaluated. One of the PPA subtypes does actually have a connection to um, Alzheimer's pathology, and so a trial of the Alzheimer's medications can be indicated, but needs to be watched carefully and reconsidered based on how the person does. So I want to bring it back to Brant and Marie briefly to ask them to talk a little bit about um, additional strategies, especially as it relates to um, Brant's increasing apathy and to support that you've found, peer support, the role that that plays. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned over the years is that changing needs require new strategies. Uh, for example, the apathy is such a burden. I wake up in the morning, I have no desire to get out of bed, but I have to remind myself, remember this is FTD doing this, get moving. So I see a personal trainer twice a week, I've been having physical therapy, physical arthritis, I try to get the earliest possible appointments that I can to force me out of bed. Um, we have this wonderful Italian physician who said, you know, we, Marie and I, was saying, you know, I get so frustrated with Brant because there's a project he hasn't finished, which was fixing a smoke detector. And she said, find someone else to fix the smoke detector, gather some friends, and go out to dinner. Um, it was just great advice. Um, I still managed to make contributions to life in my parish, but everybody has to understand it takes me four times as long to get the job done. And Marie's always there as my cheerleader to help me uh, say, you know, go for it and do what you can do. Um, so, Brent, I'm actually going to stop you there because I'm watching the time and I know that we want to be able to take some questions from the audience. So, hopefully we'll be able to have opportunities to answer questions and also that um, folks know that, that we're available to help after the webinar as well. So, let me just click through a couple slides to show folks that the resources that are available at, at AFTD, should they be helpful to them. There are some videos that we have to raise awareness. Um, we mentioned the Partners in FTD Care um, initiative up front, and I would encourage everyone to get connected with that. There are issues that talk about dealing with the loss of empathy with connecting with residential services, and the one that's coming out shortly is on apathy. And so there are in-depth strategies there that can be helpful for folks. And so with that, actually, uh, sorry, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions as, as you'd like to facilitate. Great. Thank you so much to all three of you for your um, contributions to the presentation. We did have quite a few questions come in while you were speaking, so I'll get right to those. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, any um, confusion that there might be when FTD occur, since FTD occurs relatively early in age, is it ever confused with early onset Alzheimer's disease? Um, have you heard of those kinds of situations? And if so, um, what are suggestions um, for folks on how to uh, try and get the correct diagnosis? So sorry if I heard you correctly. The question is about confusion between FTD and early onset Alzheimer's disease. Is that correct? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. So that's a very common confusion. Um, and, you know, again, the symptoms can overlap, and especially because doctors are often not necessarily looking for the kinds of cognitive symptoms and changes in behavior that are consistent with FTD, people may be given a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, early onset Alzheimer's disease. So as Brant and Marie mentioned, that nagging sense of the diagnosis isn't quite right or it doesn't quite fit is what often takes people on to the next step of pursuing either a second opinion, uh, another level of expertise. So uh, when folks call our helpline, we very often suggest a second opinion in any case of a diagnosis like this, and that where it's possible to be able to go to an academic medical center that simply has seen more patients with the array of non-Alzheimer's dementias, that's where folks will get the most nuanced evaluation in order to be able to look for some of these other possibilities. And so it's very, very difficult to get expertise at the community level where people have seen a lot of folks with FTD. And so where possible to be able to go to a clinic where they have a larger center and um, where there's more work being done in the spectrum of dementias, that can be very helpful. It's not an easy diagnosis to make. There are some tests that can rule out Alzheimer's disease, um, but they are generally things that need to be done in the context of a, a truly comprehensive exam. Great, thank you. Can you talk a little bit um, about if you have any suggestions on how to help someone with primary progressive aphasia communicate what they need? Um, the person who asked the question said that they work with caregivers and they found that they're um, pretty consistently trying to help their loved ones communicate to help um, reduce frustration and anger and could use some suggestions. So again, I, I'm sorry the the your audio is cutting out a little bit. So what are some techniques for helping people with PPA and their caregivers communicate? Yep. So again, this is actually where the expertise of a speech language pathologist can be very helpful. They, um, there are wonderful strategies, and actually we do have an issue of Partners in Care that covered PPA that I would be happy to encourage people to look for or I can direct you to with some specific suggestions. You know, there are particular strategies around speaking slowly, making sure that you're using redundant nonverbal communication as well as verbal communication so that the person has more opportunities to kind of decipher the message. Um, the SLP can really look at and evaluate what are the particular communication skills that are impaired. And this is often a very precise kind of evaluation which can really help to develop strategies for both the person with the disease and the care partner. You know, there are techniques for using communication books or communication wallets which are sort of visual prompts that can help communication. Um, there are some online programs and some um, techniques that are helping people to do rehearsal and practice certain types of words that are personally relevant for them that they can then keep active in their uh, repertoire. Um, and part of it is the communication between partners and so to be able to figure out ways where the person with the disease and the caregiver can come to a common ground of does the person with the disease want to be prompted to help to finish a sentence? Do they want to be prompted to help find words? Or, or is that too frustrating? Would they rather be able to have more time to come up with those answers? That's a dialogue that the earlier it starts between the two folks in the partnership, perhaps with the assistance of experts, the SLPs with techniques, that that can be very helpful in terms of navigating that. Great, thank you. And just for those that aren't familiar, SLP is speech and language pathologist. So um, the next question is asking, is it possible to have symptoms in each of the categories of frontal temporal degeneration, so behavioral symptoms, language difficulties, and motor function deficits, or is it typically one or the other? Yes, there's no rules. These diseases don't follow any rules, which makes it especially complicated. Um, it is, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we think, we tend to think of the disease starting in one 
focal point in the brain, which would give rise to the earliest symptoms, depending on where that is. But that's often too neat and clean, and it doesn't necessarily happen that way. Someone may not have those symptoms rise to the level of alarm, as, as Marie said, where you know I have to go talk to the doctor. And so by the time you do, it's certainly possible for people to have symptoms that kind of cross over some of those domains. Um, where you may have some executive function symptoms as well as language symptoms. So there really aren't any rules that these diseases follow in that regard. The other thing that's true is that as the disease progresses, you definitely see more parts of the brain involved and more um, symptoms than showing up in the other cognitive, in the other um, domains. So it's very, very common that someone who starts with language symptoms over time will develop um, behavior symptoms as well. Someone who starts with either language or behavior may develop motor symptoms. Um, but not everyone, and it's a very difficult course to predict. And so the other thing that's very stressful for families is just that whole question of, well, what comes next? What should I expect? What can I expect? And that's still incredibly difficult for us to answer. The researchers are trying to follow the paths of progression and the course of disease in these different subtypes, and they are learning more about that. Translating that into being able to tell families what to expect is still very, very, very far off. Great, thank you. Um, so another question came in. Um, asking if you could just go over those genetic statistics again. Uh, they were confused. Um, you mentioned 40% of people with FTD have a family history of neurodegenerative disease, but only 10% have a genetic component. Can you um, just explain that a little further? Sure. I'm happy to and, and glad to, to clarify that because, of course, when there's any risk that there's a family inheritance, this is a great source of stress for people. So. Of all the people diagnosed with FTD, 60% of the cases, so fully 60% of the cases are still considered sporadic, where there is no evidence of family history of neurodegenerative disease um, in the pedigree as you look at three generations back. So 60% of FTD cases is considered sporadic. 40%, there's some evidence of family history of some type of neurodegenerative disease um, somewhere in the family pedigree. And so that's 40% of the total. There's 10 to 12% of the total cases of people diagnosed with FTD where they are able to identify a specific mutation that's responsible for the development of the disease. Great, thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Can you um, respond um, to the following? So in addition to depression and withdrawal, is there any risk for um, aggression or violence due to frustration that um, people have with word finding? So in all the FTDs, um, well, so, um, Yes, and there are a couple places in the presentation where I pointed out that having the right environment and having good positive interventions, behavioral and environmental interventions, can help to reduce that stress that leads to behavioral escalation or escalation of symptoms, and that's definitely true. Putting that aside, there are definitely people with FTD who have a tendency towards more aggressive kinds of symptoms or agitation for sure. And where those folks are in a difficult spot or where behaviors are um, you know, really uh, very, very challenging, there are certainly a small number of cases of, of people with FTD where a caregiver may feel threatened, where their safety may be at risk. And those are incredibly important to pay attention to because of the nature of disease and that because the symptoms do not allow people to, um, the, the person with the disease is not in control of those behaviors. So there is a risk of that. But that would be true for behavioral or for language kinds of presentations. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we have uh, run out of time. Thank you so much to all of you for your presentations and comments today about your experiences, Brant and Marie. That was really helpful for folks to hear. Um, so as uh, Steve said, there's another webinar on January 30th. You'll be receiving information about that. And um, until we um, meet again, thanks everyone and have a great afternoon.